Hey guys, episode two of my discussion with Bob Ruff. behaviors displayed at the crime scene when it comes to concealment indicate in this particular case and in a lot of cases that most likely this is someone with a known personal relationship yeah and be before we go any further if for any listeners or, or viewers that are not familiar with the west memphis three case could you why don't we just go into the just the basics of what happened okay yeah so it's it's 1993 in may west memphis arkansas which is a uh, small town right across the river from Memphis. So just on the Arkansas side, um, the area where this happened was, you know, lower middle class neighborhood, but it's the, it's 1993. So kids are riding around on their bikes to run around, come in when the street lights turn on type, type of place. You've got three little eight-year-old boys who are all friends from school that's uh that we know at some point during that afternoon two of them we know were actually were out playing together and then they connected with the third one which is the one that said that he was going to run away um and the, and they're out riding around it gets dark the boys don't come home the search is on parents start looking for them well, on the back of their neighborhood there's this bayou like a like a creek that runs through and there's a big pipe and I don't know what if it's natural gas or what's through that pipe but imagine a you know an 18 inch diameter pipe that crosses this bayou and goes into this little patch of woods about the size of a football field um but you know people the witnesses said well we saw the boys headed that direction so people start scouring those woods you know late into the night the next day um around one in the afternoon an officer sees it, oh and part, through that little patch of woods there's a really small small like six foot wide uh drainage ditch that runs into the bayou that doesn't always have water on it but it did at this point and, and for what when i say water imagine chocolate milk is what i tell you it was muddy thick dirty water and uh, one of the officers saw a shoe floating in the water they got into the water actually he fell in the water he didn't need to go in the water um and, and they start searching around and they find the body of michael moore who was one of the one of the victims again, eight years old. Uh, he was nude. He was tied up in a strange way. People say hog tied, but it wasn't hog tied. Uh, he was tied behind his back with shoelaces, his right ankle to his right wrist and his left ankle to his left wrist, which is significant because if he was truly hog tied where they were crossed over or you know both sides were connected, you can't run or move. But imagine you've got a foot and a half of, of rope or string between your right foot and your right ankle and your left foot and your left ankle, you could still get up and you had to hunch over a little bit, but you can still run away like that. But he's nude, tied up like that. And then sticks were, a stick was used to wrap up into those shoelaces, jam down into the mud to keep his body concealed underneath the water. Um, further search reveals the other two boys, Stevie Branch and Christopher Byers were about 20 feet away from them. Exact same circumstance, nude, tied up in the same way pinned down in the mud and as they start searching the area they find several sticks jammed in the mud and underneath the sticks was their clothing so the killer had taken their clothes off of them i believe after they were dead uh, and wrapped the sticks up the clothing around sticks and jamming into the mud they try to make it so if anybody's searching back there wouldn't find the bodies um, the shoe is the only reason and in that area had been searched multiple times in the previous 18 hours mm. um, but the shoe gave it away they find the bodies so that, that was the kind of the basics of the case. Now, the boys had marks all over them, which I think science has proven at this point. Those marks were predation marks from uh, the, primary, the primary predator that they were, gonna, they were dealing with was turtles in the water. I went down, did a bunch of experiments, uh, and it, it doesn't <laughs> – I took a, a raw chicken on a rope and just put it down in that water and came back two hours later. I had underwater cameras and stuff on it, and within minutes – it was swarmed by 
turtles. You know, everybody's been snapping, but a lot of them weren't snapping. There's all kinds of different turtles that immediately start tearing apart this meat. Um, well, I, that's just, so the boys have markings like that on them. Um, well, anybody that's a, anybody that's actually been bitten by a turtle, not even, not even a snapping turtle, but bit by a turtle, they, that hurts. Yeah. So and you don't think, and people don't think too of their claw. I never realized until this case, but they've got big nasty claws too, uh, and so those marks were all over them. Um, and I'm not going to get into the details, but there were some pretty gory wounds on these boys. And, and this is where the case, I, in my opinion, goes bad as the officers look at the, the, uh, the victim's bodies, see these markings all over them. They're new. They're, they've never seen it. Nobody in the country had ever seen anything like this before, much less the small West Memphis Police Department. And this is early 90s, the age of the satanic panic. And so they decide right away that this looks to them like it was a satanic ritual murder someone some which is you know again further studies have shown that had that first of all there aren't any of those it was most of it was all all bs anyway the whole satanic panic uh but anything but but there was also no markers of this actually being ritualistic in any way whatsoever but at the time and and i and i'll chalk it up to to ignorance i don't think it was malicious they truly thought that's what happened so they start looking for you know, who would do something like this? Well, a guy named Damian Eccles was the typical early 90s black combat boot, black trench coat, long black hair, wore a, a, a pentagram necklace around. Uh, he's the, yeah, he must be their local devil worshiper. It's like the goth, the goth kids that, you know, listen yeah. to Black Sabbath and. Yeah, you know, exactly. They're just, they're just kids. Yeah. So, in, so they go after day, they, they start immediately put tunnel vision on and they're and they're looking at damien looking at it there's just nothing they they interview him they do all the nothing's nothing's panning out uh damien has uh his buddy jason baldwin who you know he hung out with all the time they find out that damien was with jason that day but all the witnesses say they were somewhere else playing video games but they were together that day and jason he may not wear the black trench coat but he wore metallica t-shirts a lot that were black so he's clearly a devil worshiper too um <laughs> and then <laughs> All the Metallica fans are out there going, what? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so then they... So hey, then really they, quick, they up, really, really yeah. quick, Bob. I So I grew up in Idaho and uh -huh. and I live in Utah now. And But, you know, it, it, it doesn't really matter what state you live in. There's There are police departments all over the country mm -hmm. that are just, they're smaller police departments. You know, they're they're accustomed to you know, domestic di disputes and, um, you know, traffic problems and those kind of things. And, and then all of a sudden, something of this level is thrown at them. And it, it, it really reminds me of the Crystal Bislanowicz case, which was, you know, not far from here in the Wasatch County is kind of the Park City area of Utah, if you're familiar mm -hmm. with that. But you know, they had a murder. They found a woman next to the Provo River, and the responding officer had been on the force for three years. He was a you know used to uh, investigating narcotics, and all of a sudden, he has a blatant murder on his hands, and he's like, "I I don't know what to do." Now the problem is a lot of these smaller departments don't understand, especially back then. They don't understand that there are always resources that they can tap into for help. Right. You know, some of it is ego. You know, they say, oh, man, this is my chance. You know, I, I can I can solve this case and, and be the hero of the town. And but others are just like, you know what? This is my job. Uh, this sucks. And and this is, you know, the most horrible thing I've ever seen. It, it, they'll probably live with that the vision of the, you know, that trauma. I can't imagine the officer that actually found the boys' bodies in that creek. Oh, I can't either. Yeah, it's, it's I, I don't think this case started off with any ill intentions, but what I find in a lot of wrongful conviction, yeah, because like what you just said is true. Like if there's a crime that happens somewhere else in the country away from you that you've heard about, it's probably because it was unique. And so, and then you take a police force, it's unique to you. It's certainly unique to them. And and now jump back to 1993 in the pre-internet age, right? Where you know the, the world is even smaller. 
you know, look at look at John Benet Ramsey in 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 Boulder, Colorado. I used to live, I went to college in Boulder. I used to live there. I actually I moved out there at that time. I was living there at the time. Um, but they had never seen anything like that before. Certainly, they dealt with a murder, you know, and, and deaths here and there. But a small child that was tied up with a ransom note. Never seen anything like that before, and they blew it. And 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 that happens all the time. And, and in my opinion, that's what happened here. But well, then, and, yeah, and again, most murders, and and people need to understand this too. Most murders are pretty cut and dry. It's like right. it's obvious that the jealous boyfriend killed killed the girlfriend that was breaking up with him. You know, it's a it's an act of rage. It's a spontaneous, uh, you know, just kind of happens. And you know, very rarely is it is it really apparent that it's thought through like there's mm-hmm. there's premeditation to it those are pretty rare and yeah but then you go to the next level of something that's so violent against somebody that's so innocent and mm-hmm. like the what the mess what, the west memphis three i can't i can't think of very many cases where there are the victims were more innocent and the crime was more heinous because right you know and, and especially based on by the way for any of you that have not seen the um, the miniseries that Bob did on the West Memphis Three, you said Oxygen put that out. Yeah, it's called the yeah. Forgotten West Memphis Three on Oxygen. Yeah, fantastic, and you absolutely have to go see it because it's uh, or, or order it up on your TV because it is it is worth the time. And the way the, the entire reason that we're talking is because you were so thorough on that and. Anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt you too much there, but it, I think it's really important that people understand the perspective of, you know, what was what was society like? We can't look at society today and compare that, you know, apply the, the today's society to the 1993 murder because totally different right. eras. Yeah, completely. Uh, so different mindset, different you know resources for the police. Like I said, so I, I think everything started off innocent enough. They, they made a bad call early in in assuming that it was satanic sacrifice. And there's you know reports there was an officer on the scene that said Damien Eccles finally did it right when they pulled the bodies out of the water. So that's you know the the tunnel vision was the problem. But then it gets worse. So they they're not finding anything on Damien. They're not finding anything on Jason. And then. Uh, got another uh, more of an acquaintance but wasn't even a close friend of theirs Jace, jesse miss kelly um he actually comes into the police station to report that that he was he was down with some friends hanging out around that area a couple weeks after the murder and some guy came down and was kind of soliciting them to do something and it freaked jesse out and he went to the police station and said i think that's the guy that did it well they they there was a reward out at the time and it seems like that's when they they started putting in his head like hey if you give us better information there's this big reward jesse um there's a lot of debate what his mental capacity was you know there's he said iq tests back then when he was you know got a 68 or a 72 and other people were saying he was faking it he was much more capable i've met the guy sweet guy uh but certainly is has some sort of diminished mental capacity um as a, it, it, you know his dad is quoted on paradise law saying that jesse slow minded is the way he put it back then you know he just you know certainly certainly um had some had a, had a deficit there well the police key in on on this and then this is where the, the police lose my support you know have a wrong theory look into it that's fine you know no stone unturned there's three dead little boys you've got to find out who did this but once they didn't have anything, instead of then, and they missed key steps, they never searched the houses of the victims. They never checked into the parents of the victims that were around. They just assumed they would, of course, they would never do that. So then they're, they're, they they continue to look outside rather than, you know, as you say, it's, it's Occam's razor. That's a real thing. You know, start inner circle and work your way out. Long story short, then you get all the details on the docu series or on the on the podcast if you've got fifty hours um, to listen to this to season five. Um, but they they bring Jesse Miss Kelly in, and they record a conf- a, a confession with him. Now this now you've got him saying no, he's got nothing to do with it, doesn't know anything. 
And then, and I wish I had the episode number off the top of my head because I could direct you to right to that. But if you look up the Jesse Miss Kelly confession on season five of Truth and Justice, it's one of the episodes I've done out of a thousand episodes that I'm the most proud of. And I took, I spent weeks taking the actual audio recording of Jesse's police interview and, you know, would play a bit, hit pause, tell you what just, you know, you know, point direct you back to what just happened, tell you what you're looking for, where the mistakes were made and analyze that interview step by step by step. And when you do that, it's, it's atrocious. So he ends up confessing that, that him and Jason and Jesse were him and uh, Damien and, and Jason were down there uh, to do some sort of satanic ritual, which he can't describe what it is because it was a made up story. And these three boys end up wandering, you know, wandering down there. And then he gives all these details about how the, they killed the boys. It changes the story multiple times during it, gets it wrong, you know, it, and the police are feeding him everything. You know, they're, they're, if you look at the transcript and if you only look at Jesse's words for, you know, the, for the, 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 the most important part of this confession, his words are, yeah, yep. Yes. Yep. Uh huh. I think so. Like, like the police are saying. So then, they did X Y Z. Yep. And so, th so then, did they do this? Yeah. Did they? The police completely. And there's no debating this. One hundred. You know, I had on the docu series. I had uh, Jim Trainum, who's a false confession expert, on to break down that. And it's, it's just nonsense. They are. The police are one hundred percent feeding him. The, a, a story a kid with a with a diminished mental capacity who's who's willing to just say whatever he needs to say to get out of this and that's how they end up able to arrest damien and jesse was off jesse miss kelly's confession they end up getting they all three end up getting convicted um jason and jesse were sentenced to life in prison and damien was sentenced to death uh, and then, you know, the long legal battles ensue, you know, because of thankfully for Paradise Lost, they had a lot of funding, a lot of celebrity support over the years that funded DNA testing and further investigation that shot holes into the state's case enough so that in 2011, the, the defense presented to the prosecutor the option of, at this point, by the way, Damien, who was on death row, had been put in solitary confinement for 10 years. He'd been in solitary confinement for 10 years on death row. Um, and uh, the defense presents to the prosecution, you know, about an Alford plea. They're just battling this out. The state was fighting him for doing DNA testing. They did the DNA testing. DNA showed none of their DNA on the scene, but brought in some new suspects. And uh, for those of you who don't know, an Alford plea is, you know, in this situation, the state agreed to say, all right, I'll tell you what, we'll throw out the old conviction. You plead guilty. They've been in prison for 18 years at that point. You plead guilty to the charges and we'll let you even maintain your innocence. That's, that's, that's what makes it an alpha plea is the fact that they pled guilty while acknowledging on the record that they're saying they're innocent. And in exchange, I will sentence you to time served. So essentially, they go home that day and that's what happened. So they went in, they said, you know, I'm pleading guilty even though I'm innocent. They all three pled guilty. The judge puts down the sentence of time served, and they finally walked free in August of 2011 with the case still unsolved, no justice for the victims. And things went silent until you know, about 2018 when you know, I came in and, and brought it back up to the, with the podcast and then eventually made the docuseries and breathed new life into the case. And now we're, you know, we're once again battling, battling the courts to, use your technology to use MBAC to do some DNA testing that hopefully is going to finally bring a resolution to the case. Yeah, uh, it's it's amazing how many similarities you know, of, of what you're describing from this case happened to the Angie Dodge murder in Idaho Falls, Idaho, and a young 17-year-old guy named Chris Tapp was eventually uh, put in prison for it. He served 20 years. Yeah. And he was finally released. And the, the wonderful thing about that case is not too long ago, uh, they actually found using the genealogical DNA, they found the actual killer. And, you know, similar to this case, the, the killer, the, the real killer actually lived right across the street 
Mm-hmm. And he was interviewed and he was in the case file, but um, they never really honed in on him. And, you know, it's, it's amazing in hindsight, how many times we can look at a case like this and kind of, you know, what, especially once all the details come out, we're like, oh yeah, that totally mm-hmm. makes sense. But yeah. for the investigators that are going through it at the moment, especially back in the nineties, you know, do, doing those kind of hardcore interviewing tactics, you know, that was just kind of the practice of the day. You know, you right. could never, you could never do that today. Uh, right. You know, your case would get thrown out in a second, but back then that's just how they did it. And, you know, I don't, I don't blame the officers for it. I mean, they're, they're in a small town, they're a community that is screaming. I can't imagine the pressure that these guys were under saying, solve this case. These little boys deserve justice. And so they were looking for everything they could possibly do. And they, they saw, they saw a possibility and they pursued it. And sadly, they, I, they pursued it way too far. Yeah. I do got to say that for, for me on the record, I do blame the officers for the way, because even in 1993, yeah. you know, the, it, and you have to really listen to the interview to hear, I mean, that was not in any way, shape, or form them trying to find the truth. It's very obvious from that interview, those officers, by that point in the investigation, knew that the entire story was a lie, and they they went with it. They went with it anyway at that point, and that's you know, in that in that particular instance, that's not a, a sign of the times. That that's a corrupt cop trying to close a case. Mm. Essentially, the you know, Damien and Jason and Jesse were some trailer pack trailer park kids that didn't matter, you know, they were going to close the case and be done with it. And it's just, it, it's, it's pretty disgusting to me how they, how they handled that interview. I mean, I mean, when you have, you know, Jason or Jesse through their, through their leading and them suggesting and pushing stuff, trying to come up with a narrative and saying that they were, you know, choked in the throat with a stick and tied up with ropes and stabbed with knife. None of that's true. It's all provably false. Mm. And they're just like, yep, close enough. Like, no, it's not close enough. <laughs> no, I, I don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not, uh, not trying to make excuses for, you know, bad police work. That's the, every, every single cop I've ever talked to, they said the only thing that's uh, m- the most horrible part of our profession is, are the bad, the bad apples. Because yeah. when, it, you know, a bad apple in an office environment is just a guy that you're just like, oh, well, you know, whatever, he's a jerk. Mm-hmm. But a bad apple in police, they they can really screw up a lot of horrible things. And, you know, clearly these three that were put in prison uh, unjustly, you know, just like Chris Tapp, I, I just my heart goes out to him and 20 years and 10 years in, in solitary confinement. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we hear like the John McCain story where he was in, you know, this prison camp in in Vietnam and the hell that he went through. I, I mean, these guys in solitary confinement, he may not have, he may not have been tortured, but being stuck in a box for 10 years when you're innocent, uh, the mental anguish that somebody like that goes, and, and you know, the prison system is, is what it is, but the, the very few that are in the prison system that are innocent, I think are just that, that is a travesty that we have to rectify yeah, it's horrible. You know, working in wrongful convictions, people ask me all the time, you know, if, you know, if cops hate me and if, and if you know, because I'm always tearing apart the, the cases that they build, but it's something that the exact opposite is true. We have tons of people in our audience and that contributors to our work that are, that are law enforcement officers and former law, former, former law enforcement officers. And, you know, they'll all say the same thing. Nobody hates a bad cop worse than a good cop. Like, the, it, you know, I'm not, exp- I'm, I'm not out here exposing and calling out good police work, which I think is, is most of it. It's, it's the guys that, that cross the line. It's the bad apples uh, that are, that are destroying lives that we're calling out. 